as part of the CGIR as to how we can best respond both in the short and, and medium term to the food and nutrition security crisis. Um, what I'd like to do to introduce more though is to run through and the, the next slide please uh, Doina. In the uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks, we um, have been working with a number of you to to build up um, some areas of, of of research or policy influence, a number of dimensions which I'll, I'll talk through. Um, but we are also doing that within the context of the C overall CGR response as a CGR research institute. How can we contribute to the overall CGR effort in this area? And the slide here shows the four key areas that the CGR response is, is looking at aligning uh, the centers and programs around. Firstly, around market driven food systems encompassing uh, production. Um, with with an objective of, of seeing how we can enhance manage food and nutrition security in this the immediate response to COVID-19 and the recovery period. An emphasis on One Health. So what are the opportunities to prevent and control COVID now and in the future? Um, and the connection and management of the connection between human and um, animal pathogens. Inclusive public programs, how can the response mitigate the food and nutrition security impact for vulnerable populations? Not just the immediate food and nutrition impacts, but the livelihood, the employment and the associated uh, impacts that the, the, this crisis is having on, on particularly impacted and vulnerable populations. And then how can we use this research to develop um, short and medium term policy advice that will help our partners in the countries where we work and others to provide good policy to help all manage the uh, COVID-19 um, situation. Join the next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a high level um, analysis that was was actually conducted by um, some in the CGIR of the uh, current fish research program called heat map looking at some of the key outputs that we had planned for this year and then a lot their alignment to uh, those four um, core areas of research and the different dimension of, of those I this is um, still in a draft phase and we're responding to this analysis but essentially you could see um, medium uh, you know a range of sort of um, uh, alignment with uh, the different dimensions of the CGR uh, response and perhaps those around you human health animal health um, are particularly um, light but areas of production areas of, of governance and others um, a very strong. This next slide shows uh, just a snapshot of some of the things that have been going on and some of the uh, areas of, of attention. You'll hear of the work in the markets, um, Ben Belton, and um, trying to understand more about the impacts of COVID on the functioning of markets and value chains and the access of producers to inputs and the access of consumers to um, fish products in a number of uh, countries. We've spent a fair bit of time also supporting our genetics teams, um, securing, sustaining the core genetics assets of the organization. Both now and in the future, we believe that uh, sustaining those quality inputs to the aquaculture sector in, in many of the countries where we work will be critically important in uh, in responding and obviously being a productive sector in, in, in the future. We've done less around One Health, although 
So we've started to explore the ecosystems of One Health in a number of countries. Can you go back, Doina, please? Um, inclusive programs, we've engaged in Odisha in, um, in, in India to, to look at how some of the uh, women's self-help groups that we've engaged with over a number of years are able to interact with government support programs there. I'm particularly proud of some of the policy support and coordination work that has gone on. Um, Shakuntala was heavily involved in an early piece of work with the Committee on Food Security and feeding our and her knowledge into this very high level early guidance piece. And a very nice piece in, in Bangladesh where our team worked with other CGIR centers to to have a coordinated set of policy recommendations to government on how to assess and manage risks associated with COVID-19. And that, that's appeared today in the Bangladesh newspapers. So that's quite a high profile and potential uh, impact. Next slide, please. We can look more broad, if we look more broadly at the areas that we're engaging with and these particular areas are um, and the items within them are developing um, all the time but basically good needs assessment so we've just completed a, a first round of understanding from the countries what's the level of the assessments that have been done of needs and how we can be responsive and prioritize our support based on a clearer understanding of impacts at country and community level also seeking to use our comparative advantage where it's where it's relevant to support uh, governments and partners in countries to respond well. A number of areas in the research area that are emerging, the market systems work is, is emerging as a strong area with value chain analysis, monitoring of impacts and some emerging futures modeling work. There's some emerging work on natural resources and ecosystem health uh, in, in the Pacific and looking at how the um, uh, ecosystems of the fisheries resources provide that safety net at this important time. Less on One Health and inclusive public programs at this time and some policy analysis and guidance provided as I mentioned in the last slide. These efforts are all directed really at delivering outcomes. We need to be very focused on research, delivering useful outcomes that people can use forward and apply to the benefit of the communities and stakeholders that we are working, for, ultimately working for. So the sort of outcomes we can see emerging and uh, strongly within the program around policy documentation, a risk analyses and management strategies for uh, value chains, some emergent work on, on fisheries management recommendations, digital tools, and I think in all countries increasingly a closer connection with national governments to see we are aligned and helping the overall policy response. We have a number of what I've called enabling systems now um, coming into place, some digital work around digital tools, the communications uh, uh, team have been working hard to um, upgrade a part of the website, look at the, some specific blogs and short-term briefs that can be developed, and we're using MS Teams quite well to enhance communication. Uh, increasingly coordinating and teamwork across the, across the organization focus on making sure ethics are properly considered and um, increasing use of the MEL system to um, uh, in future to ensure that uh, we're properly monitoring, evaluating what we're doing. Next one, please. And so these are some of the key questions. Which measures can we take to sustain production, ensure supply and consumption of a highly nutritious food group? How can we protect workers and populations that depend on this food group? How can we ensure that we're working in a complementary way and supportive way with others in this space? And how can Wellfish make its pivotal 
we make use of its pivotal position as the leading research center as part of the one CGIR in the fisheries and aquatic foods and systems sector. So I leave those questions with you and we'll come back to that during the uh, during the session. Thank you very much. And I think back to Shakuntala, um, to you and possibly on to Ben then. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Now we'll give, the, uh, give, uh, give um, Ben to talk and please let us keep to the time or else we would not have time for any Q&A. Ben? Uh, thank you, Shakuntala and Mike. So I'm going to summarize the research that World Fish has ongoing on the impacts of COVID-19 on fish supply chains and people dependent upon those supply chains. Uh, so this has been uh, going on for about the last month. We're almost at the stage of, of rolling out the survey and we expect that to start happening next week. Uh, so as we became increasingly aware of how serious the crisis was, we tried to think through what impacts it might have uh, on fish supply chains and, and people in those supply chains. So uh, these include uh, disruptions of the distribution of food, uh, reduced incomes, falling demand, and then lower production, uh, and partly due to falling demand, partly to, due to disruption to access to inputs. And so those could re result in higher or lower prices for producers and consumers, depending on the, the exact context of how they're occurring. Uh, and then a variety of hypothesized responses to those impacts. Um, we are seeing reduced economic activity overall, uh, large numbers of migrants from urban areas returning to rural areas. Uh, and as uh, people have lower incomes, uh, we're likely to see reduced consumption of uh, nutritious aquatic foods. Uh, we may also see greater reliance on uh, subsistence fishing and farming uh, as, as people are unable to, to find work as they typically would. And a variety of coping strategies, so people becoming more in, indebted potentially, uh, sale of assets, uh, to, to cover expenses and the reconfiguration of supply chains. So, for instance, through direct sales between uh, producers or retailers to, to consumers or uh, consolidation as smaller and medium businesses uh, go out of business. So we wanted to try and uh, come up with indicators that would help us track these uh, impacts and responses uh, in real time. And so key uh, variables to keep track of are quantities and prices of inputs being purchased by people in the supply chain and products being sold uh, by other people in the supply chain. Also uh, access to, to work, uh, wage rates, access to transport, disruptions to trade and markets and, and coping strategies being deployed. So we designed a, a very simple survey that could try and capture some of these indicators. Uh, we've decided to implement that in six countries, so Timor-Leste, Myanmar, Bangladesh, India, where we will be working in three states, uh, Egypt and Nigeria. Uh, so this is a questionnaire that we'll be administering on a weekly basis by phone. Uh, each interview should take about 10 minutes. The first time that we do the interview will be a bit longer. We'll ask about recall information for January, February, March and April. And this will give us kind of a baseline leading up to and into the crisis. And then from that point onwards, we'll collect uh, information on a weekly basis. A uh, standardized set of questions across each of these countries, um, looking at nine different uh, nodes or nine different sets of actors in, in the supply chain. So feed mills, feed sellers, hatcheries, farms, fishers, processors, traders and retailers. Uh, we're targeting about 115 interviews per country and we anticipate somewhere between eight and 900 interviews per week in total across all of the countries. Uh, we've designed a, a questionnaire that will be implemented using a Kobo toolbox. And so this in includes general questions that will be asked to everyone about their ability to work, to hire labor, to access inputs and sell products and, and to cope. Uh, and then we have for each kind of actor specific questions about the quantities uh, of, of inputs that they bought and the products that they sold during the past week uh, and the prices that they paid for or, or sold those at. 
Um, and so how are we going to use the information? Well, we, we're planning to design a, uh, a, a data visualization interface that can be um, embedded in the WorldFish website. So anyone can come to the website and uh, very easily uh, produce sort of summaries of the data uh, depending on what they're interested in. Uh, we will produce regular summaries ourselves and feed those back to the countries and distribute those to stakeholders more widely. So anyone, anyone who's interested can have access to these summaries uh, and, and kind of track what's going on in real time. And uh, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And now we go move over to Cynthia McLuhan. Thanks, Kuntala. So I'm picking up here on what Mike said, and that that is um, that we're essentially working for people at World Fish, and that World Fish's aim in all of this is to protect and support the people that we are working for as developing countries navigate the COVID-19 virus. And so I've picked this header from the BBC because to me this is a it's a powerful reminder to us that the way we succeed in this is not by reducing this to a series of technical strategies in supply chains it's not even about economic strategies or health strategies but it's by also and equally engaging with this as a as a social phenomenon um, and to kick us off on this what I've done is is that on the left, I put together a few ideas from the literature, some lessons about what's going on with COVID globally and some from past pandemics. In the center, then I, I look at fisheries and aquaculture as a sector. And so what I'm doing here is, is saying, so if we apply a social and gender lens, what do we see in terms of who is more at risk? Why, what's going on with that? And what does the global and what we know about fisheries and aquaculture tell us about what to anticipate, risks and some lessons? And so to, to kick us off here, um, I'm gonna start over on the left. Disease, what we know with COVID, of course, uh, in terms of mortality, men are more vul vulnerable. And if we move to fisheries and aquaculture and ask that same question, that will hold. But not all men will be uh, equally vulnerable or as buffered. And we unpack that more in terms of disease risk. And we say, OK, what about exposure and vulnerability? Globally, on the left, women show up as having higher exposure because of the work that they do, the burden of the unpaid care work puts them at greater risk. Similarly, where they work in the sector. And if we move to the middle and we say, okay, what about exposure in fisheries and aquaculture? What we see is the same pattern here. Um, women have very high exposure rates relative to men in terms of um, the, the fact that they predom women predominate in fish retailing, processing and retailing in markets and that factory floor work in very high dense conditions. Not that some men don't as well, for example, men at sea on boats, but that the, um, the, the numbers suggest that women will have high exposure rates. Disease risk globally, we also see, and I hope everybody's paying attention to things like the New Scientist articles about ethnic minorities are bearing disproportionately high costs of this disease, even in the UK and the US. If we move to fisheries and aquaculture in the countries we work, we can draw a parallel here. When we talk, um, step out and before COVID, we talk about the blue economy and the communities that lack voice that are vulnerable in those larger changes are similarly, they're vulnerable here because again, they lack voice, they lack access to express their needs, access to medical care, and also then because of the nature of the work, the, the fish trade may increase some exposure dimensions. In terms of health and safety, Globally, the big, big lesson here is that is that the solutions we had, that we choose that we're trying to improve and protect people with can have very perverse outcomes. Globally, we know, of course, gender-based violence has spiked as a result of the solution, which is the lockdown. Learning from Ebola, the, the investments in solving Ebola led to a diversion from women's medical needs and more women died from complications in pregnancy and childbirth and died from the actual disease that was being fought. So we translate that to health and safety in fisheries and aquaculture and right away we know we have to pay attention to the risks of the strategies and of course that the same, um, the same issues are there. Everybody who is involved in the fisheries value chain is touched by the spike in gender-based violence. The, the spike in transactional sex that we saw post Ebola may very well happen again in fisheries and aquaculture in relation to COVID. Finally, economics. Globally, we saw women and marginalized groups losing their jobs fastest and having slower recovery rates. And to conclude here, um, economically, if we believe um, the if pre evaluation that it's not so much the farm node, but the mid chain, and we say, okay, who is in the mid chain in fisheries and aquaculture? It's the retailers, um, and that's where women are really um, 
they're they're predominating, that suggests that women are more at risk, and and not just in terms of losing. Um, jobs because of the informal and casual nature of their work and, and disruptions to the market, um, also incurring, incurring losses as fish retailers as they have to hold on to uh, fish longer, for example, but slowest to recover in a number of ways, including that care burden will never go away, even post-COVID. There are things like rebounds where vaccinations drop during the epidemic, women end up dropping out of work again. Um, to, to take care of children who, are, who have preventable diseases. Women are dropping out of work now because they cannot do the unpaid care work and continue to earn an income and slows to recover also because they didn't have the same access to capital in the first place that's required to rejoin the workforce as entrepreneurs and um, in SMEs, for example. And the last bullet there is that what we learned from past um, uh, epidemics like the avian flu was that there was a consolidation of businesses larger businesses and then what we know from a gender and social lens in this area is that women are most likely to get pushed out. Uh, they don't have the assets to adapt, innovate and rejoin at that higher level. So all of that suggests there's a lot of strategies to consider, a lot of risks to consider and I hope that someone will raise those questions about that third column, what can we do in the question and answer section. Thank you so much Shikuntala. Over to you. Thank you Cynthia. And now I will begin with the first of the four country presentations, Mike Akister from Myanmar. Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. Greetings from a very warm Yangon, Myanmar, where currently the temperature is 39 degrees Celsius. I'm going to talk briefly about the COVID-19 impacts on fish production in Myanmar uh, now, right now and the food availability prospects for the end of 2020 and indeed into 2021. But just to set the scene, uh, Myanmar has a low population density with over 60% of inhabitants living in the rural environment. And this may well have a bearing on the fact that there have only been 127 cases of COVID-19 reported officially to date. 75% of these cases are in Yangon. Uh, the largest and most populated city in Myanmar. Capture fisheries uh, within Myanmar, both marine, coastal and inland, are in severe decline, while aquaculture production, mainly freshwater carp, is increasing, now accounting for a third of all fish produced and consumed. Aquaculture production is concentrated in the Iowadi Delta, particularly around Yangon, and fish are marketed at large wholesale markets and then either exported, uh, consumed in, in Yangon or repacked and distributed over the whole country nationwide. So what are the impacts at the moment of COVID-19 and what are the future risks? Currently road transport networks have been severely disrupted either by official restrictions movement uh, movement from Yangon, the COVID-19 hotspot, or by inhabitants from towns and villages, the length and breadth of the country, turning back vehicles from Yangon out of fear that the vehicles will bring the virus to their locations, kind of uh, vigilante approach. Export markets are shut and many local wet markets also. If fish from aquaculture, which produces a third of all fish available in the country, is not available in 2020 and 2021, this will put additional or could put additional pressure on hard hit capture fisheries, with more illegal fishing having an impact on biodiversity and ultimately the safety net, which Mike referred to in terms of fish being available for the rural poor. So what is World Fish doing? What are we, what are we helping with at the moment? Our large, medium and more small scale research for development projects sponsored by a range of donors, including USAID, ACAR from Australia, EU, BMZ, IDRC, the Global Environment Facility, FAO, among others, uh, in close coordination with the government of Myanmar and implementing partners, are carrying out so, the following. We're adapting aquaculture best management practices to update information on how fish, how to keep fish, hatchery and distribution and farm workers safe. And 
to do that, we're looking at social distancing, even in when harvesting ponds. We're looking at improved post-harvest quality control. You, some of you will have seen fish dumped on the side of a pond without ice on the earth. Well, we're looking at ways of ensuring that that tra uh, transition of fish in the pond to the market is the time is reduced and therefore the quality of the fish improved. We're encouraging people to disinfect all surfaces within hatcheries and indeed the, the fish distribution unit so that uh, the virus, if it's present, will not contaminate others elsewhere. We're ensuring that the aquaculture season can start. I mean, it sounds strange to say this, but there is a, uh, there is a risk that because of the disruption to transport, the fish seed and feed will not be available. So we're making sure that seed for fast growing fish species uh, will be available at the start of the aquaculture season, which typically coincides with the start of the monsoon. We're also looking at ways of transporting fish seed using uh, avoiding road networks, using uh, local air transport. And there's the, there is a, a, a big network of, of small airlines operating across the whole country. And also the, the use of boats in the extensive uh, waterway network uh, especially in the Delta. With many wet markets closed, farmers are being encouraged to partially harvest their ponds and market the fish directly. And they're doing this by telephone contact and using social media like Facebook and some of the uh, web, sorry, uh, mobile phone applications which we've been sponsoring and setting up over the last three years. And of course, our main aim is of our, of our work is to keep farmers and fishers aware of the COVID-19 risks and how to avoid them while maintaining fish production, the fish production cycle to ensure fish availability now and over the next six to 12 months, which will occur if ponds are stocked at the start of the monsoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And now over to Joseph to tell us about Malawi. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Shakuntala. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'll talk briefly about uh, Malawi, the situation, and uh, how we are trying to respond to the impact of COVID-19. Uh, just as uh, in other countries, uh, the, the impact of uh, COVID has not spared uh, Malawi and the whole of Africa, where actually the measures that are happening to contain the situation is almost similar. These, are, these include the social distancing, closure of schools, uh, but uh, uh, recently there was announcement of lockdowns, so all these have really affected the, uh, the food system. Um, and, and some of the impacts that we are basically seeing uh, in Malawi where, um, uh, uh, in terms of cases, it's not really much, but it's the measures to contain this which are, are almost civil and have a, a high impact risk. Uh, so in terms of our impacts, uh, we are basically seeing a high demand of our processed fish in a country like Malawi where most of the population do not have uh, refrigerators. Uh, so to, to, to pile up uh, food stocks, uh, stocks, what they do, basically do is to buy a lot of fish where basically 70% of the uh, 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 protein uh, comes from in Malawi, using Lake Malawi especially. So they're buying this fish to, to pile up stocks uh, in-house and the, basically this is the dry fish because they cannot buy fresh fish. So there is quite high demand for, for, for this dry fish. And some of the measures that government has also put is about um, uh, uh, transport restrictions, where in terms of public transport, uh, the seating capacity has been reduced. So this has also an impact in terms of distribution or supply of fish to markets, where um, in terms of making up the high transport costs, uh, there is also high uh, uh, prices for fish. This transport uh, fee is also uh, put on the uh, price for, for, for fish. Um, uh, there is also um, uh, restrictive uh, uh, chains, uh, uh, as I can, as Mike pointed out, where basically some markets uh, have been closed. 
So basically what uh, uh, fish traders do is to operate in other uh, uh, small markets, uh, which means that I think they are not basically selling uh, the fish as they would. So um, uh, these are some of the impacts. But most importantly, um, I think 70 to 80 percent of processors of small fish species in Malawi are women. And because schools have been closed, I think these women are having it difficult to uh, do their business of uh, processing fish. So these are some of the, the impacts that uh, COVID has brought uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the food system. So what are we uh, uh, doing to, to, to track this? We think that we need to immediately uh, to look at um, how we can actually monitor the, the, the quantities or the fishing effort, the price, the market prices, to basically ascertain what has happened and how much uh, this has happened. So we would also want to look at access and the um, availability of fish products on the markets, how people are utilizing them, uh, the consumption of fish where it has reduced, uh, but also uh, in terms of fishing effort, uh, we presume, uh, we suspect that uh, because um, uh, people are, uh, have very little alternative livelihoods, maybe there is a high uh, uh, fishing effort from the lake, the lake being uh, an open access. So some of the, I'll talk briefly about some of the responses that we are immediately doing as Malawi, um, uh, which includes, the first one is that um, over the three years, we have been working through a, a program on trying to promote um, uh, uh, um, improved fish processing technology, especially using solar tent dryers. The idea is basically to improve uh, loss uh, and waste uh, from, the, from the lake. So what we have done is basically to use that program um, uh, where we have come up with a product um, because we see that there is high demand for uh, dried fish. We want to enhance supply of these dried fish using a financing mechanism to make sure that uh, women processors, especially women and boys, have access to loans uh, that they can construct solar tent dryers, which cost about a thousand dollars each. These are big solar dryers to contain uh, a, 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 um, a large quantities. So they are getting these loans basically to uh, build these solar tent dryers across the, the, the lake so that we increase supply of dried fish. And um, we have seen this um, uh, very good response. I think the, this product was basically uh, finalized uh, two weeks ago. And by yesterday, we had about 60 people that have actually applied for this loan, uh, basically to make sure uh, that uh, uh, they, they have a solar tent dryer. So our, our, this finance product basically is the, uh, more uh, targeted to the fishery sector, especially women where um, uh, in terms of loan repayment, we are basically considering the seasonality of the fishery, uh, but also we have looked at the interest rate. Uh, in Malawi, normally one of the, pro the problems is high interest rate, where people actually pay over 26% interest. But in this one, we have actually tried to have uh, interest that women can pay, but also uh, interest that uh, uh, men can pay. Uh, so uh, for, for, for women, there is about 9% over uh, the base lending rates, and for men, 11% over the lending rates. So basically, the, as I said, the idea is to ensure that we promote uh, the supply of clean quality uh, uh, dried fish, uh, which is, has a long shelf life, at the same time actually is also um, uh, safe uh, to eat, and it can also enter the formal markets. These are super supermarkets uh, uh, where basically prices are a bit stable than open markets which are closed. The other uh, response that we are, we are basically uh, uh, planning is uh, a recent discussion that we had uh, with all the CG centers uh, in Malawi. We have eight CG centers in Malawi. The issue here is to come up with an idea looking at post-COVID-19 uh, uh, response where we can actually try to help uh, the communities in terms of uh, seed supply systems, but also using our technologies to ensure that uh, people are, are, are coming out clean and also they can continue with food production uh, post-COVID-19. So this is basically an idea which you just uh, came out this, this week. 
and we are basically starting to uh, discuss within all the HCG centers in Malawi, and a concept note is currently being, uh, being developed, uh, which will be given to the Donor Committee on Agriculture and Food uh, Security uh, in Malawi. This is a, a committee of all donors that support food and nutrition uh, uh, in Malawi. So I can stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. And now I'd like to give the floor to Delvin Bosco from the Solomon Islands. Good evening from Honiara. Um, great to be here with you all to share what's happening in the Solomons. Uh, a quick summary of what is happening across the country first. Um, Solomon Islands maintains a COVID-19 free status. Um, the country has been under a state of emergency since early April and extended for the next four months. Um, in response to the health and um, economic crisis spurred by the event, the government has encouraged urban dwellers without formal employment to return to their provinces. Government ministries have put junior staff on leave with likely salary cuts and are working on um, reduced staff as a result. Um, street side and suburban marketing in the capital um, has been banned except for the one central market in town and um, the National Agriculture Ministry has called on people to um, build home gardens and so many households in Honiara have started um, home gardens, including myself. Um, we're looking to understand the impacts of um, COVID on fisheries in, in the country and the study. Um, we have adapted our approach from the study led by Ben Belton and team. Um, our unit will be the village through key informants that we have relationships with. So not the same analysis with farmers and fishers. Um, this is a low cost pilot in terms of dollars effort and relationship to see how we are capable to collecting information using this method under these circumstances. And in terms of the frequency of the survey, um, we have yet to finalize that, but we are um, starting in May. Um, the phone survey we will do in 25 communities across three provinces. Um, we're looking at um, calling up two respondents from each community, a male and a female, and um, estimated time uh, likely 10 to 30 minutes. And we'll be using um, Survey Monkey in this instance to help with um, quick analysis. Um, in terms of a hypothesized response, we, pre we presume that there's reduced economic activity, there's greater pressure on resources due to the return of ta town mig migrants to rural areas, um, there's re greater reliance on subsistence fishing and farming, and marine management rules adapted, eased or halted. Um, so we're checking up on food production, including fishing, um, changes in fishing practice and sales. Um, some of these communities have marine resource management practices in place and because of the migration of people back to the villages, we will ask about how management practices and rules have been adapted, if they are, and whether the newcomers are aware of the rules. Um, in terms of outputs, we're uh, contributing to the World Fish um, sort of briefs and outputs on COVID. We're providing information to the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources in country and um, information briefs for donors as well. We're talking about a blog and we're hoping to contribute to the fisheries, um, SBC Fisheries um, Bulletin. Um, that's a quick one from me. Thank you, Shakuntala. Thank you so much, Delvin. And now we move to Arun Padaya from Odisha in India. Arun? India. Hello. Namaste and good afternoon from Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. Uh, in India, World Fish is very active and doing intense projects in Odisha and Assam. Uh, these are the two eastern states and we uh, we have a uh, uh, very good uh, i mean uh, uh, you know uh, policy level interactions with these two states and uh, five major activities we have uh, 
uh, conducted as a response to COVID so far. First is that uh, we have given high level policy uh, in, I mean, policy support to government of Odisha and government of Assam to, uh, I mean, to to give the, I mean, uh, uh, exempt the fishery sector from lockdown restrictions. That is number one. Number two, we have supported the Department of Fisheries in, in both the states for bringing in guidelines and other implementation practices for smooth functioning of fish markets. This includes social distancing norms, cashless trade transactions, media campaigns, demand and supply surveillance, and also economic loss is through government machinery, but with the support, technical support to conduct these surveys and activities. And then the third one is that developing the support package for COVID affected stakeholders in Odisha. We have given the support to develop this package of $8 million under Chief Minister's Relief Fund. And then it has gone to Prime Minister's uh, uh, COVID uh, support fund also. We have asked for through the, the Department of Fisheries in Odisha. The fourth one is that we have given technical inputs to World Bank to include the COVID specific responses to uh, uh, newly uh, pipe, I mean, it is a developing stage uh, program on National Blue Revolution program uh, to be implemented by Ministry of Fisheries. And then finally, we have initiated COVID impact survey designed by World Fish. These are the five major activities we have conducted in response to COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun. And now we will open up for questions and answers. But before that, Doina is going to put up a sheet on the COVID-19 wolfish response that if you look at this slide on the right hand side, we are requesting contributions and comments for the for what World Fish can do in relation to responses of the COVID-19. So if you would please give us your responses and, uh, and your feedback on that, that will help us very much in making our interventions together with the partners, with governments and the countries in which we work. Thank you. Now I want to go to um, Ben. There are three questions which have um, questions which have put together, which I'd like your response on. One, in this on your survey, would government department staff be included? Two, who would have access to the data you are collecting? And three, have you considered inclusion of consumers in your survey? Ben. Uh, thank you, Shikantala. So, the people involved in the data collection vary on a on a country by country basis. Um, so, there's a slightly different arrangement in each place. So, I believe in uh, Assam there are government staff involved, uh, and possibly also uh, one or two in Myanmar. Um, but it's on a case by case basis. Um, in terms of who will be able to access the data, uh, so we want to make this as that both the results and the data itself as widely accessible as possible. Um, so we want to have it posted on the, 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 the uh, with this interactive interface on the website that people can uh, come in, create their own readouts, and also download the, the data. Um, and we want to make it as freely accessible as quickly as possible. Um, and then thirdly, in terms of consumers, uh, yes, we certainly have thought about consumers. Uh, I think in order to get good information on consumption, it requires a rather different um, approach to uh, 
the, the one that we have here. So this is something that we're definitely bearing in mind, but we want to get this up and running first, uh, and then we can pause and think about uh, what whether there's a possibility of collecting uh, robust information on, on food consumption. Thank you, Ben. I'll pass on now to Donia to ask um, some of the other questions and to come with some inputs. Hi. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Donia, oh. we can hear you. There was a very bad echo, but it's gone now. Go for it. Hello. You okay? I don't hear anyone. Donia, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello, we can hear you. Yeah. For the brief internet problem right there, um, I have some questions coming in, and I will go to uh, to Mohan's remark. We should also compare and contrast responses with respect to fisheries and developing and developed countries. Uh, do you want to add something to that, Mike? Uh, thank you. No, I, um, when I listened to the presentations from the countries, and thank you, uh, Joseph, Delvin, um, Mike, uh, you know, for for that, uh, really, uh, really excellent. And I and Arun, sorry, I can see there. There's quite a lot of similarity in some of the approaches, some of the analysis. So this to me emphasizes the, the importance of just keeping this sort of communication going. There's a lot to learn across the, uh, the across the country uh, initiatives uh, here. Um, and um, yes, as we move forward, then um, lots of a lot of a lot of learning and synthesis certainly can 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 be done. And um, you know, Ben is building up a, a bit of a team there that has will have some synthesis, uh, you know, responsibilities to to help uh, distill, uh, you know, key learning as we move forward and try to get that out on a on a, on a regular basis. But we're looking across the organisation for you know, all those that are, are, are engaged to be able to um, provide some uh, you know, learning, contribute to learning pieces across the organization. So a good comment, uh, Mohan, and uh, I think that just emphasizes the, the importance of our cross-organization, cross uh, co cooperation, sharing and learning. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Victor. Cynthia, thanks for the presentation. Are considerations of COVID impact on access to land for women as we may have more female-headed households? Back to Cynthia for that. Thanks, Doina, and thanks, Victor. That's a terrific question, um, and it's certainly a very complicated one. Um, the, this, I think the essence of the question, if it's about looking at the ability of women to have and control the assets they need to be resilient in the face of COVID. Um, I think there's probably two, there are two dimensions that we'd want to look at this at, and one is um, what's possible now in the very short and immediate term um, in this sort of more intense phase, and then what's possible as part of a recovery and moving out. Um, I think uh, land is a it's sort of the holy grail of equity in terms of gender and assets. It's incredibly complex because it moves through formal, as you know, it moves through formal policy and also um, cultural practices. And so to me, that's unlikely to be something that we could engage with in the very short term, um, but it could be part of setting up uh, strategies with governments um, and uh, civil society and communities to start to look at building assets, including land, sort of over the next five years um, as people move through this this most urgent phase. I think in the super short term, um, something that we might want to prioritize would be um, control access and control over assets like um, as 
um, as alternatives to income and social protection measures come in, making sure that they're not only going to households, but that women, we're finding some ways for women to have control over assets, both because we know that's good for families, but also because it means that um, it'll contribute to women's ability to rejoin uh, the workforce and economic sector and to keep up with the kinds of changes that are going to be happening really quickly as, uh, as we move into the next phase of COVID. So I'm super keen to keep talking with you about this, um, but I'll stop there for now. Thanks so much. So we have another... Hi. Hi. Is it possible to ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, first of all, um, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Yurdi Yasmi. I'm from Erie, uh, your sister center. Uh, I think this is a very good uh, seminar, so I would like to congratulate uh, Wolfish and all the presenters. Excellent. I just would like to ask, you know, you present uh, various, you know, activities, assessments you are doing from gender aspect, uh, as Cynthia already explained, but also country by country assessments. And in your slide that you put on the screen, um, you also, uh, you know, explore different themes. I would like to ask if uh, Waltfish is also doing some forecasting or like foresight analysis post-COVID. Um, you know, certainly there will be uh, no going back to normal, I guess. We will have to live with new normal, right? So I would like to know whether this foresight analysis is also part of the research themes that your team is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, I think we'll leave that answer to Mike. Yeah, thanks very much. Really pleased to have a colleague from Erie on, on the call. And we had a very productive discussion this morning with other Erie colleagues about rice fish systems where we're working together. So this is a really good time to come together as a CGIR and bring our um, complementary skills and insights together. Uh, that's a general comment. But the, the more specific uh, response to your question on um, you know, foresight type research, yes, we haven't started anything yet, but we, we have a discussion going with IFPRI to conduct some uh, uh, futures type uh, scenario modeling uh, uh, analyses um, in, in, in the near future. And, and I, I'm, I'm aware of some work within ERI on, on that, which I think shows the real value of, uh, of, of doing that. And happy to share a bit more of that uh, offline. And, um, uh, but I, I think we do agree this is uh, important to just look beyond the immediate crisis and, and see what some of the trends are and their implications for the bigger picture of uh, markets, jobs, food production and food availability and uh, accessibility and consumption. So thanks for bringing that up. It's it's there. It's an area that we need to uh, further work on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. We have another question from Harrison for Ben Belton. Whichever way we consider the impacts, there seems to be one result, increased prices, which will end up hurting the most vulnerable. Is there a direct mitigation mechanism or tool in the exercise that we can include to advise governments and donors on possible actions? <coughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure we necessarily do know that prices will increase under all circumstances. I think that varies probably from, from product to product and depending on which point we are uh, in, in the crisis. Um, so I think this was kind of designed uh, with keeping in mind just the need to generate um, immediate information about what's happening. Um, and so based on what we see emerging, then we will be able to kind of better uh, provide advice based on the, the situation on the ground. I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to go to uh, Dave's question. We are seeing civil society pushing back on government restrictions to protect the most vulnerable. 
should be engaging with civil society to provide research-based evidence to support programs and interventions. Um, Mike, again. Uh, yeah, th thank, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, it'd be good to learn a bit more about the specific examples there that you have, but uh, our, our, our research will be, uh, and uh, particularly through the, the sort of enhanced website that our, our communications team are working on with, with Ben, will be available to um, essentially to all as international public goods. And so that would include both government, non-government, and the private sector, as uh, stakeholders and you know at various uh, levels so yes it will be available be interested in the specific questions come up and to see whether they are being properly addressed in the research program as we um, formulate that or develop that thanks dave yeah maybe i would guess that uh, david was um, uh, dave was referring to what i briefed him earlier on about uh, the uh, civil society in malawi where uh, there is um, kind of um, uh, pushing back government initiatives um, uh, to look at protecting the poor. Uh, but I think what civil servants are looking for is actually evidence which we could be generating uh, in terms of what are government's uh, measures, uh, uh, what are they doing in terms of pro poor uh, measures. If they look at, especially on the issue of lockdown, how would the lockdown affect the poor? So they'll be looking at evidence, uh, such kind of work that we are doing to provide them that I think we can actually cushion the poor by providing uh, 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 adequate or sustainable supply of fish. Uh, so that would be the, the issue that they'll be looking for. So I agree, Deb, that yes, we need to engage um, uh, uh, civil society in the move that we are doing because there is uh, those kind of uh, uh, restrictions, but also them wanting basically evidence that the poor will be protected. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much. This is Shikun here now, so thank you, Donya. I'll close the question and, and answer session. And I just want to make, uh, to remind you of um, that file that we posted, where we are asking for contributions and comments from Wolfish for the COVID-19 response. I also want to remind you that the presentations are posted so you can have a time to look at them and, yeah, and, that your, and that your answers to the contributions we would, we would get online. And if there are any more questions, we would make sure that we post the responses online. Thank you. Over to you, Mike, to say a final thank you. Okay, thank you, Shakuntala Doina, so much for putting on the uh, this this uh, hour's uh, session on COVID-19. Thanks to all the presenters, uh, and thank you to the amazing number of participants. I think over 140, 141 now I can see. So thank you very much for participating. Get the questions there in the chat. We'll capture all all those, and um, there's an opportunity to provide further. Uh, feedback on our other research response as part of the CGR in the uh, document that was shared by uh, Doina. Um, appreciate all the inputs everyone's provided over the past couple of days as we do develop our uh, uh, research response um, and really look forward to keeping the, the level of communication, uh, engagement and uh, cooperation going across the organization. And with the many other partners that have joined, thanks very much for joining and looking forward to further uh, working with you in future. So with that, I close the meeting. Thanks for your participation. Stay well, stay safe, um, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>